all right. I'm not so bad. Who's that? Oswald? Hey, Oswald. Oswald. Saying hello. No, you're not saying hello. Miserable little soul. <laughs> yeah. Are you well? Yes, not so bad. Things have calmed down a little bit, so we might be able to get this going on a bit more of a regular basis. I do apologise to anyone who tries to follow. Um, it does, you know, round about this time, it just jumped a little bit, but I think we might get a bit more of a flow on it over the next few weeks. Yeah, I'm hoping so, because I've actually missed the conversations. I've missed the... Yeah. I've yeah, it's been completely my fault, to be perfectly honest with you. I've just been busy with so many different things that it just seems to... All weeks go by and you don't realise anything's happened. So anyway, I'm back on the editing trail. Um, I've recorded the, 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 the story that we are actually talking about tonight, um, where there are spoilers. Um, so again, I'm going to put the spoilers coming in the whole discussion of this. So here comes the test card. <laughs> And if you're still listening to us now, we're going to spoil the fuck out of this thing. OK, yes. so, um, yeah, but it, because it's another one of those rare ones, isn't it? It's another one of those weird rare ones that. Yeah, uh, we which I, admit, I like that. I like the fact that this is something that I wouldn't have fallen on by accident under no. any circumstances. So, yeah, thank you for this. It, yeah, it's very interesting. Like that. So so I had to record my own one. Um, I don't know if I made that clear before. If I didn't make it clear before, I did do a recording of it. You'll find it on the Ash and Cole reading list. And we'll put another test card in now. And now we're back. And so uh, two test cards. So to, to you, you have no excuses now. No excuses at all. Right, but it's there. It's on the reading list. I quite like that reading. Have you had a look at the reading list? What I did? No, I haven't. No, no. no. Right, we because we read all these short stories. Yeah, and we always find something on YouTube. And there's been two now that we haven't found, so we've recorded our own version of it. I have seen it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I found all of them and put them on a reading list. It's a playlist on on the yeah. channel. Brilliant. Yes. There. It's what a resource. Um, it really is, yeah. And some of them are just so unput down. Some of them are junk. Some of them are stories to which, yeah, I but wouldn't listen to it with stolen ears. But, right um, now on that list, there are 40 stories because there's one I, I'm not allowed to do because that's the more that's the contemporary one we did that right. was from the magazine. Yes. So, But right now there are 40 short stories from different people who have recorded them all over the all over the internet. Uh, and, and we of everything of every story we've so we've covered so far. So that's that list is now going to continue to grow. So keep a lookout for that one. Brilliant. Right. So do you want to know what we've been reading this week? What were what what were we reading this week, Colin? Great tongue twister that is. This week we have been read. I've been making Ash read Twilight, but this one by Majori Bowen. Um. Uh, and I've been thinking about this synopsis. I really have been thinking very hard about this synopsis. And the only way that I could really think about describing it is it's about, it's, it's a, a, a fictional account of Lucrenza Borgia. And please excuse my pronunciations because they're all over this. Lucrenza Borgia, who, who is a genuine historical figure, who was the daughter of a Pope, the Borgia Pope. And this is a, a fictional account of basically the last night of her life and how she was uh, a, an Aphrodite of her time. She was the most beautiful woman. She, she heralded from Spain and she was uh, to, to Italy, married into Italy and was considered the most beautiful and yet the most debauched woman in Italy. Um, and the history of her, when you read the history of the, the Borgia family, is really twisted. It makes Boris Johnson look like a saint, right? They are that twisted and, and everything like that. So this is about her being in the garden, knowing, I think, knowing that it's her last night of her life or she's getting close to the twilight of her years. And she meets a young gentleman that she would say 10 years ago would have been all over her because they wouldn't be able to resist her because she's so, you know, um, gorgeous and slutty and, and lustful. Um, and then, but he, all he can smell and see and and see in her eyes is evil, and that she has, she was almost soulless and just evil, and so he runs away, and in running away, 
she manages to catch up with him very stealthily, but she now looks very different and not covered in makeup. And so he manages to sort of push off her advances and she wants to of roam. And then he gets back to the palace and finds out that she died and that they found her on the lawn and that they'd taken her into the into the palace and she died. And what, so at the time when she he was being chased, she was actually in the bed dying and she died before she was able to take the bread of her last um, confession and um, ceremonial thing for the Catholics. Yes. Yeah, uh, which is a name I can't remember, but anyway, not mass. Sacrament. She couldn't take the bread of the mass. And so, and, and that's where it just ended. In, in, it ended in a very odd way with the last line by going, that's not what she was thinking about 10 minutes ago. You know, but we'll discuss that in a little bit. But that's the basic story of this 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 woman in the twilight of her years that used to be just so adored and, and lusted after dying. Two seconds, I just got I need to get oh I thought the telephone was ringing, but yeah, it's been picked up. Right. Okay, right. <laughs> yeah. Not a problem. So that's that's the synopsis as far as I could really tell. That sounds pretty much like the one that I read, yes. Yes. Yeah. So what did you think of it? Um, oh, oh, you're asking tough questions now, aren't you? Mm. Um, right. Sorry about that. We had a bit of a glitch. Thank you, yes. Um, um, right, so yeah. you were saying... I was saying it's the best thing I've ever heard. Yeah, um, and yeah, that <laughs> might well. uh, no, I just I didn't particularly enjoy it. Um, it reminded me too much of Top Girls. Um, you know the Carol Carol Churchill play Top Girls, yes. where it starts off with the historical figures, and we're meant to see these historical figures and be oh so impressed by these historical figures for who they are and what their achievements were, and it just looked like that sort of thing being done over again with this woman who was a genuine person from history but has been made out to be this two-dimensional caricature of her lusts and her her desires for for cock for want of a better word i was trying to think of a nice way of phrasing it there but um, right. yeah well historical context on that just for now uh, before i get into in, into my thoughts on it historical context is she genuinely, genuinely did have a huge love for cock. Yeah. Um, she was considered to be the queen of the orgies in Rome. Um, there were many rumours that she was involved in her brother's death, as well as having incestual affairs with both the brother and her father, as well as uh, deaths of husbands. So that, that actual side of things does have the historical context. The, the difference is, though, I, definitely, is Luenza. Borgia uh, was actually the daughter of Pope Alexander the seventh, sixth, um, and he, you know, um, she was an educated woman. She was sk very skilled, and she was considered to be very um, intelligent in what she did. But she never made it to the age that she is in this story. This is one of the things <laughs> I don't like about it. I mean, I get that. I get that she was a real genuine human person who existed. I get that she had this life and that there were potentially aspects of debauchery involved in her life. We don't know how much of those are genuinely true because we know that history tries to rewrite the histories of women, um, usually with a bit of a downward slant on them. Yes. So if a woman does something really, really good in that case, yeah, history will um, piss on her from a great height. Um, but what I didn't like was the two dimensionalness of um, the character that we'd got in the story, where it's just she sat there. She's a bitch to her friends. She's a bitch to this guy she wants to get laid from when she doesn't get the dick off him. In that case, she's even more of a bitch. And then she dies. And it's just, wow, way to have no character arc whatsoever. That's like a character flatline. Yes. Does that make sense? Absolute sense. Absolute yeah. sense. Because... The beginning of this story, I was taken. The woman yeah, being held up, yeah. the description of the gardens, the moonlight, the pond. I loved the particular description of the reflection. I thought that was fantastic. The, the um, it was, uh, oh God, I can't be asked. Um, 
Yeah, the uh, the way that she described this this reflection looking back, I thought was just amazing. Um, and at some point, I will try and just uh, I keep glancing over just to see if it jumps out on me. I'm sure it's on that page. But the um, and and everything about it when she's a vampire, <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm thinking, I I'm loving this. She's a vampire sitting by the water. And this young man comes. I'm like, I'm like, yes, I'm in for this, you know. Um, and the way she's dressed and everything about it was like, I'm, yeah, I'm great. I'm, I'm really in for this. And then it just stops doing any of that, and it just moves so far away from it. And I don't, and I just couldn't quite grasp what the intention was. I mean, we've read stories here and individually. Uh, where the stories don't really have a meaning. They don't necessarily have a beginning, a middle, and an end. They might yeah. be kind of like an on-median res type idea. But the there's still an idea behind it. There's still a kind of like, oh, right, it's the middle of someone's life, but you kind of get it and go, oh, right, that, like you say, it, instead of it being uh, a beginning <laughs> and an end, it's actually a character piece. So you're getting just this this description of a character and you walk away understanding that character here all the stuff i know about the character i've had to go off and watch on youtube or read the footnotes or there's no understanding at all of if you didn't read or know any of that historical stuff it's just like reading a name she has yeah. no personality i mean as you know I've um, written some stuff about uh, some erotic material in the past. So part of my research has meant looking into people like the Borgias because, um, yeah, they did have this debauched lifestyle. So I was I was familiar with them when I was, um, yeah, I was familiar with those when we first came across it. But again, it's that whole thing of taking them from being humans who might have had vices, might have had terrible things that they did in life, and just reducing them down to, oh, they did dirty sex. Um, and yeah, and I, like you, I was thinking, there's this vampiric quality, and we need to get this vampiric quality. Oh, that would have saved that story so much, but instead, yeah. all we got was just a missed opportunity. Yeah, a missed opportunity. They had, they had the strangest ghost I've ever read, I think, in that, because... You know, I mean, you know my theory on ghosts anyway, um, yeah. you know, because you actually wrote it into, and I love that, you actually wrote it into, into conversations with oh, yeah. dead serial Why do ghosts yeah. wear clothes? It makes no sense, you know. Um, and it goes with the whole all ghosts are Victorian as well, doesn't it? There's that, there's yeah. that kind of um, argument as well. But here, she turns up with plasters on her face. Yeah. You know, it's like... Hang on a second. So she's, they found her, they stripped her, they cut her up a bit in order to bleed her, and then stuck plasters on her face. And that's the ghost that chases after the young man? Yeah. I don't get it. I, no. I mean, uh, I think well, yeah. one of my problems, um, and it goes back to what you were saying before, about having a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, this has got a really, really strong beginning. Um, it's got the end to a different story. Yeah. And I think the middle just sort of like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, a middle of, of just what? A middle yeah. of trying to tie the two things together. I mean, one of the things that I did for my PhD was because I'd broken stories down into the beginning and middle and end for the different super genres, um, I tried writing a story that starts off in one genre, that's got the middle of another genre, and has got the end of a different one. Right, um, yeah. And, it was sort of like it was a challenge, and to make it cohesive and whole, um, what I did was I relied on the um, on the semantic content rather than the sync. So the syntactic stuff went through. So you've got the beginning, middle, and end of three different stories, but semantically it was all one constant. Yes, and this didn't have that one constant there. No, and and it's not that you have to have that one constant either when we, we've read stories things like the eyes have it for example was yeah. a particular one that granted when i first read it i didn't get because of the historical stuff around it you know when you just it was a lovely parody piece but when yeah. you actually put the historical context on it it becomes something more you know that's great um and then when we read the i have no mouth but i must scream i mean there you have a very 
very postmodern idea of, of writing in that really kind of stretches the conventions of a, of a narrative arc to its limits and, and keeps things in a really sort of like, um, but still keeps things in an entertaining way. Here, it doesn't even read like an experimental piece. And I think that's the part of the problem is it doesn't, it's not like you, you set the stall out going, this is now going to challenge you as a reader because yeah. it's not going to conform to the way that you think a story is going to conform. This one starts exactly how you expect that story to start. And it doesn't go off on a tangent. It, like you say, it, it's almost like a different story completely, just bolted on. You it know? reminded me of an episode of um, a TV show I once watched where um, this guy is trying to prompt an audience, he's sent somebody out into the audience to shout out the, um, the questions that are going to feed his gags. And the guy gets them in the wrong order. So <laughs> this fellow comes out on stage and he says, my wife's just gone to um, the West Indies. And this bloke from the audience shouts, how does she smell? And yeah, it was, <laughs> it was that juxtaposition that, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and that is, that, that's a really lovely analogy for it, actually, because it's, it, there's a number of ways that this story could have gone where it would have been brilliant, to be perfectly honest with you. One is because it's also like the metaphor of the wood, you know, the dark wood that they go into. Yeah. It's in the wrong place. <laughs> it's just, it, it comes in the wrong place when it's, it, that's not the moment that it needed to be in. But if it was, if, the, if that was like the beginning of the story and he was being chased by this hag who then yeah. met an elderly woman that he actually thought was quite lustful because he knew who she was and they both turned out to be the same person, bang, you've got a lovely twisty horror tale that would make you go oh my god you know it's the the difference between makeup because the, the description of her wearing the makeup was just beautiful as well it was just you know yeah. and and that i was you know that could have been a really nice theme for the thing and not necessarily and but be still same sort of stuff but just the opposite way around the other one is is where if she turned up as the younger version of herself as the ghost luring the man to his death you know, so he's met her, realizes she's evil, runs away, then meets a younger version of herself, nearly dies, gets back, and then actually finds out that she died. And that's when the younger version, and then that's where you put the two and two together. That would have a bit more coherence about it than just the way, because it was almost like the bits, he's running through the woods, and you're thinking that at that point, it's still vampiric, it's still going all right. And then she just turns up. And it's just, it's almost like the whole thing just explodes at that point into the, almost like, it's sort of like, like Bowen herself just went, ah, fuck it. <laughs> right. Obviously, there's, there's a strong chance that there's something that we're missing. We are both Possibly. subtle men. We have got white privilege. We are males. We are not from the 1930s, whereas Bowen um, wasn't male um, and did live in the 1930s perhaps there's something from that time period that we're missing perhaps there's something i'm i'm going to actually say is i'm not going to knock bowen herself in the same way that we didn't knock charles dickens and all that sort of stuff as as a writer she is immense yeah yeah she has got collections these short stories that this one comes from comes from a whole collection that she called her twilight series and right. i and i get from, from what I've seen in a couple of the others is that quite a lot of the time they are just kind of stories that pitter off. They are just a kind of like spooky idea rather than a whole coherent story. And I don't mind that, to be perfectly honest with you. I think that's, that works in a really nice way as well in that kind of almost black mirror tales from the unexpected, you know, kind of way. And, and that's how this feels like it was going. It's just... It, like you say, it's almost like it's a different ending. Don't you find, though, that things like Black Mirror and Tales of the Unexpected did have a strong narrative structure? They sort of like started off, you knew who the villains were, you knew where they were sort of like meeting the inevitable outcome and fate that they were going to get, whereas this one didn't have that particular structure. I mean, I get what you're saying, and I do like the idea of them being sort of like short descriptive pieces um, that are just more mood than narrative. Yes, but this one, it doesn't quite work because of that end, I think. I think, 
like I say, if, if you just change the way that she turns up, yeah, you can. The rest of it still works. It's not. It's not that there isn't something there. Is it the rest of it gets destroyed by what happens, and that's the problem with it. Because say the opening section of this and going into the woods, her descriptive powers are immense. They are just incredible, and I could read that and keep reading that. But it's that we've said it before with some of the others. I mean, you know, let's be let's be completely fair here. When we spoke about Mr. James, who is a master of the ghost story, we yeah. did complain twice. We complained about his endings and the way that he ended. These stories just seem to pitter off rather than have that kind of strong idea to you know to to leave you with. And it feels like that here. It's almost like the idea of finding out that the 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 woman in the woods is the woman that you met previously and she's now died. That should have had so much impact about it but the choice of using her as this old haggard plaster-faced woman i think is where it falls apart it's the choice of the it's the choice of the antagonist at that moment in act three um you know i think i mean i i fully agree with you i think that's where it's falling down i'm wondering if um if we look at what was happening in the 1930s um you've got sort of like Obviously, there's um, fear of the impending war that's coming up. Um, so, no, I'm struggling. I'm grasping at the straws. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was. And um, also, the, the big, the big mistake. I'm just actually having a look at it. You say, say Let me just have a look at that a second. It is 1912. 1912. Yeah. So it's pre World War One, isn't it? Right. So it's pre World War One. It's yeah. um, just after the um, Fond of Siècle period. Um, yeah, you've got an awful lot of things going on where people were afraid of disease, where people were afraid of the um, fragility of life, where women didn't have autonomy. So yeah, all of these things do come into play within there. Um, the fact that the young man is the powerful hero, but the real central character in the story is this frail, vulnerable, elderly, dying old woman. Um, that used to be a force of nature. Yes. And I think that's and that, I think that's where part of it is kind of playing. So that maybe we're looking at a couple of, of mistakes there, how, how we wouldn't do it nowadays. One is yeah. the, the, the sudden flip of the character just, you know, in, in, in the old woman. And the historical context. If we didn't have the historical context of um, Lucren Lucrenza, would we be as critical of the way her character is written? Do you think also the fact that, um, and this is not me trying to insult you, but do you think that because we are relatively irreligious, um, that we don't sort of like see the fact that she didn't get that final sacrament as being the, oh my God, Imagine she saw oh, that stage that, and she didn't get that. I see I, that bit. I did get what 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 really upset me at the end wasn't actually that. Um, I'll re come back to read that. What really upset me at the end was the <laughs> coming down to the last line. They carried her in from the garden an hour ago. They bled and plastered her, but she died before she could swallow the wafer. Open bracket. Hush. She was not thinking of holy things or seeny. Close bracket. 10 minutes ago. And it's almost, that's like a wink to the audience. Yeah. And that's the bit I didn't like. She, if, if you had that kind of, and before she swallowed the wafer, that suddenly gets, I like that because, you know, I do understand the, you know, the, the, the abolition of sin, which is yeah. something she talks about. But then adding that kind of Orsini going, yeah, well, she wasn't thinking about that, was she, eh? Hey, hey. <laughs> 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 wasn't wafer she was into swallowing no oh no hey, hey. <laughs> yeah and that and and that's what i mean is it's, it is that again and we've had this quite a few times and i think we have this a lot with contemporary writers as well is sometimes i think you can write yourself into a cul-de-sac and they're just throwing things at it to try and get to an ending because it needs to be published or it needs to go in a book or it's, you find it's been found in the drawer as a half piece as a as a piece that was just trying something out and you think, oh, I'll put that in this publication to, you know, because you needed to get a collection of short stories out. 
and it and it not really being you know i suppose nowadays it'd be the editors wouldn't it that are supposed to sort that out and go back and go rewrite this this is not working yeah that's putting a hell of an onus on the editor though isn't it but yeah but i think that's what that's what a lot of editors are supposed to do they're supposed to sort of like sit there not rewrite it but to actually go back to the writer and go you can do better than this surely yeah you know, and I always say that is sometimes like it's like Dan Brown for me. I know it's cheap, it's a cheap shot to have a go at Dan Brown, and I think a lot of the way the, a lot of people have a go at Dan Brown is a cheap shot. But I actually think the biggest problem is he has a weak editor. He has an editor that doesn't want to upset him. So there's a lot of things in his books that wouldn't be there with a strong editor. Yeah. And so you know that, that and it's not it's not changing his writing. It's almost like going. You do not need to describe this person three times in one chapter, <laughs> you know, things like that. And, and that's where it gets the reputation from, I think. But with this one, and it, and it, and it does, I mean, how do you start? How do you get this? I mean, this is just um, incredible, isn't it? Uh, the pool was shaped. Uh, no, this pool was spread with thick vines, blah, 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 to get through the surface of the water in between the sky uh, the sky was reflected placidly, and the Duchess looked down at the counterfeit of her face as clearly giving as, the ha as in a hand mirror. It was no longer a young face. Beauty was painted on it skillfully, false red, false white, bleached hair, curling, dyed, faded eyes, darkened on brow and lash, lips glistening with red ointment. I mean, that's wonderful. It really is, isn't it? That really brilliant. Yeah, that is wonderful. If if I could ever write a paragraph like that, I would be very very happy indeed. What a choice of words! You know, the counterfeit. That was the bit. It was the counterfeit of the face. I thought, what a fantastic way of describing the reflection. We you also getting echoes um, throughout that of uh, Robert Browning's poem, "My Last Duchess." Yes. Well, I thought it was going to go down that line actually. I, I, again, it was one of those, the way it starts and the way it kind of moves, is it, there's, there's, it's almost like it's full of false leads. Yeah. The, the, you know, where is this influence going? You know, is it going down the Gothic route, you know, with, with all the sort of wonderful sort of like palace in the background with the terraced gardens? Or is it going down the route of, like you say, the last Duchess, and this is actually going to be, she's going to be killed by a jealous husband, you know? Um, is is it going to be that whole kind of like wanting to capture youth? You know, so are we just going to get a pathetic character that doesn't want to get old in that kind of respect? And then and then you get none of that. None of that seems to really happen, even though it's it's promised. All of that is yeah. promised. It never really seems to happen. Yeah. So there was a potential vampire story that didn't happen. A potential murder mystery that didn't happen. Yeah. All there is is a woman dies and a bloke makes a knob gag. Yeah, yes. Right at the end, he makes a knob gag. And yeah. that's, where it, that's where it feels flat, because it's the promise of this story is just so wonderful. And I say, even running through the woods, it's in, as soon as she, the old version of her turns up, the pace quickens to an almost mind-bending speed, just to rush. It's like a race to the end at that point. And it's yeah. and you know it's um. I think I'd rather if the old woman turned up and it never explained it was her until one little piece of evidence that of that showed it, yeah. You know. Yeah. Anything would. I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't bad. It was just disappointing. Is that fair? This is exactly what we said with the signal map, isn't it? Yeah. It's. It's not. It's, and actually. Now I've just said those words, you can almost say that this is, like, this suffers in the same way that the signal man suffers. It's beautifully written, but yeah. the characters are two dimension, two two dimensional. Yeah. And it just doesn't have a heart. And I mean, I've got nothing against two dimensional characters as a time and a place for them i mean with what forster said about flat characters and round characters there is definitely a place for flat characters um, but if you're going to have flat characters you need a lot more story than we had there and and there wasn't a lot of, excuse me there wasn't a lot of story there no but 
what an example of description. And, mm. and I would say from a creative point of view that, again, this is sometimes where I talk about things being test pieces, because that's how it feels at the end of the day. It feels like a piece where someone's sat down like Dracula's guest felt for me, where he's just playing with an idea, just seeing how a character sits within a scene, you know, because the, 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 the whole scene of sitting by the pond is just so beautifully written. You know that that was everything that that whole scene of sitting by the pond was everything about the story and it's almost yeah. like she just wanted to write that scene and then and see where it goes and it didn't really go anywhere but that scene existed in that respect and maybe this is why this one was a hard one to find because you know say there are other um majori bowen uh short stories out there and i can't remember this is a non de plume by the way um i can't she has she she does um when she's not doing short story writing i can't remember what her name is but um Betty Swallows. <laughs> that was yesterday. Um, but the, um, yeah, so that, so it, it, you can have that as a test piece. And I would, I, I would wholeheartedly recommend anyone who wants to be a short story writer to read this more yeah. than The Signal Man in a way. Though, I mean, you know, the descriptions in The Signal Man were very good, but I would definitely suggest reading this purely from a description point of view. You know, not from a story arc, not from not from a construction point of view, but for the the whole scene where she describes how how her and her ladies are dressed is one of the best examples of a visual introduction of a character that I've read. I think you know that that is it, that was on par with, with the film version of something like Captain Sparrow, Jack Sparrow arriving in the first Pirates movie. It's just you know, it's just a beautifully constructed introduction of a character yeah but unfortunately it doesn't continue on the back of that one but it's definitely worth reading just for that alone definitely well worth dipping into yeah but um but at the same time it's worth dipping into as an experiment it's not worth dipping into thinking what's going to really entertain me this evening oh absolutely uh, yeah this is yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is this is your legwork because because writing is and short stories are your life. Yeah. <laughs> That's what this is. It's yes. not. Yeah, it's like you say. It's not. Oh, what picking up a film. This is this is watching those hard movies. I was trying to think of one. To me, it's like watching something like Citizen Kane. It's watching a film that you don't particularly like, but you know it has important bits in it that you're going to use when you're making your own movie. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, and I would definitely say it's part of that. And, and if not that, I, I definitely suggest, you know, finding some more Majori Bowen and having a, a good sort of like dip into her back catalogue. And that's not a euphemism, however good it sounded like one. It sounded like a brilliant one. Yeah. Um, and, and we've all dipped into her back catalogue. Um, yeah. No, um, uh, I was wondering if um, the other stories in that, um, might, if they're all twilighty themed, in that case, if they might actually tie in with that and give it more a sense of cohesion. That would be good if it does. I think I'll have to investigate. I'll have to get myself a copy of the actual Twilight collection and make sure I order the right one. Um, yes. Yeah, no sparkly vampires. <laughs> no, no sparkly vampires. But that, I thought that was quite... And that's where I thought it was actually going, to be honest with you. Did I enjoy this more than I enjoyed Twilight? Probably yes, even with all its faults. But um, yeah, I mean that might be that might be a thing actually because it is it might be something that as part of a series it suddenly if it comes back on her and she's a she's a character that appears in another story from that point of view and therefore it becomes more like Dracula's guest at that point as being this kind of introductory thing and it's, and there's a bigger plan at, at work. Or it could be that Orsini um, ends up going down the right path because he didn't decide to sort of like um, grab a granny. Um, or, <laughs> yeah. He decided not to Wayne Rooney her. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so that could have been an interesting, not the whole act, but the interesting idea that he was drawn into kissing her, even though her ungents, which I thought was a great word, her ungents stank. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, going around sniffing an old lady's ungents. Um, that's, um, yeah, it's never going to be a good thing. See, I love, I must admit, I've, I've 
loved every minute of reading these stories for the language. I think some yeah. of the language used in these stories is wonderful. And as you know, I do try and use that kind of phrasing sometimes. I like old phrasings. Um, yeah, they're brilliant, aren't they? Um, I'm, I, I'm picking the next story, aren't I? You are. So let's just finish off on this one. We're going to say have a read of it as a curiosity. Definitely, yeah. It's not going to entertain you, but my God, the descriptions are magnificent. So it's worth reading just for that, but only because you are heroes as when it comes to short story writing. But also, somebody might read that and think, um, guys, you were talking out your arse, you missed this point, this point, and this point. Stick it in the comments, please. Tell us where we went wrong. I yeah. don't mind being told that I'm wrong. Well, I do mind being told that I'm wrong because, um, yeah. Usually I don't mind I'm being told I'm wrong. Sometimes I yeah. even pay. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> right. You think we're wrong in that case? Yeah, tell us, please. So, this, what are we reading next week, Ash? We're reading at the Mountains of Madness, H.P. Lovecraft. I know I'm predictable. I know. Yeah, it's just doesn't matter. Yeah, the, at the mountains of yeah. Wow. I mean, there's going to be a lot to discuss because I, I will say, yes, OK, we could definitely read that as long as part of the discussion is going to be some some of the adaptations of that story. Because I think there's there's in particular a John Carpenter film that was superb and a Doctor Strange movie that didn't kind of go there. It was just a title. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. But that's great. I am so looking forward to looking forward to that one. I know, I know H.P. Lovecraft is going to form such a major part of my academic future. H.P. Lovecraft is. I know it is. Yes. Him and H.G. Wells. Um, is it the H initial that you're liking it? Or H from Steps? Is he going to be part of this as well? Well, as long as he's got a second initial and then and then a, a lovely last name. So I've got Wells and Lovecraft. I think they're just great names. Nope, his name was Ian Watkins. Um, <laughs> really? Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No wonder he likes being called H. Yes, I'll send you the song. Um, <laughs> <laughs> put it in the comments, Ash. Just put a link in the comments. I will do, yeah. 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 One of my yeah. favourites, yeah. <laughs> well, that's brilliant. Well, uh, thank you so much for the discussion tonight. Uh, yeah. Hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, likes, bells, other kind of YouTube crap. Yes, please. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yes. Yeah. See you later. Bye. Bye.